2000 was a tough year for the sport of NASCAR. In May, the sport saw the tragic loss of Adam Petty at New Hampshire International Speedway, followed by Kenny Irwin Jr. at the same track just two months later. After these two incidents, the sport had been through enough. NASCAR was not doing enough to keep its drivers safe. Families were heartbroken, and fans were clearly impacted as well. However, the third fatality of the 2000 NASCAR season was just around the corner, and no one saw it coming. This is the story of Tony Roper. Tony Roper was born in December of 1964 in Springfield, Missouri. His father, Dean, was a racer, so naturally, Tony got involved in racing as well. He started racing in 1986 at 22 years old, just a few years after his dad started racing in the ARCA series. He raced modifieds and late models on various Midwest short tracks for about six years. In 1992, he was the runner-up finisher in the American Speed Association's Rookie of the Year race. In the same year, he collected his first top 10 in NASCAR's Southeast Series and only his second career start. After competing in ASA for a while, he made his move up to the NASCAR circuit. He made his first couple Truck Series starts in 1995, finishing outside of the top 20 in both. After no NASCAR ride in 96, he raced a full season in 1997. He raced for Bob Breivik with sponsorship from Conquer. The season started off well, a trio of top 15s in the first seven races. By year's end, Tony collected two top 10s and finished 18th in the standings. Not bad for his rookie season. 1998 was a big step in the right direction. He finished on the lead lap 13 times, compared to just three times the year prior. He amassed six top 10s and even had a second place finish at IRP, losing out to Jack Sprague by just two seconds. He was doing everything right, finishing better and finishing more races. So with this, he got a part-time gig in the Bush Series racing for Steve Coulter, who'd go on to win two Truck Series championships as an owner. His Bush Series team did not see much success, but Roper made the most of it by collecting three top 10s in 16 races. It was late in 1999 when Roper signed a two-year contract in the Bush Series, piloting the number 50 Dr. Pepper Chevrolet for Washington Irving Motorsports. 2000 was just plain terrible for Roper. He failed to qualify for 10 of the first 13 races, and then the team folded due to financial problems. But then he got an opportunity to race a few Truck Series races at the end of 2000 with Mike Mittler. Unfortunately, mechanical problems took him out of contention at IRP in Nashville. He had a decent Richmond race, then failed to qualify at Dover. Coming into round 23 at Texas, it was time for a rebound. His Bush Series gig went horribly, and he was coming off a DNQ. And Tony put that tractor in P15 during qualifying, his best run for his new team. Texas was a new track in NASCAR. It had just hosted its first race a few years prior in 1997. The race started off with a pretty nasty wreck on the second lap of the event. Chad Chaffin, Rob Morgan, and others were involved. Then, on lap 33, the worst case scenario happened. That is Tony Roper in the Mittler Brothers truck, and it is torn up. Now there's flames coming out of the underneath side, and the window net is not down. That is the signal to officials that he is okay. Meanwhile, the other truck involved for sure was the 43 of Steve Grissom. There may have been one other one. You can see parts all over the front straightaway. It's our second caution of this race and still do not see that window net coming down on the 26. Rick Ware in the 51 and Steve Grissom in the 43 were racing hard when they made contact. Tony Roper saw the pair slowing down. He tried to thread the needle, attempting to pass both cars at once, but Grissom's left front tire, right rear hooked Roper head on into the wall. It was a nasty impact. After his truck hit the wall, it bounced off of it and he was T-boned by Grissom directly into the driver's door. The mood at the track completely changed after a handful of minutes. About five minutes after the crash, Roper was still inside of the truck. Rescue workers had to cut the roof off Roper's truck to remove him. Reportedly, he was unconscious and unresponsive at the scene. Unfortunately, after being flown by air to a hospital, Tony never regained consciousness and was pronounced dead the following morning. He was just 35. 
It was determined that Tony had a severe neck injury that prevented the flow of blood to his brain. His dad, Dean, was at the race at Texas Motor Speedway and was at the hospital with him. It was NASCAR's first fatality at Texas Motor Speedway, the second in Truck Series history, and the third of the 2000 NASCAR season. Track president Eddie Gossage stated, I've never seen a car or truck turn and take a bite and go head on into the wall like that. Last night, it was a head-on crash into the wall. It was a violent couple of impacts for sure. Naturally, NASCAR executives and other drivers offered their condolences to the family. The incident also had an impact on those at home who were watching the race live. Multiple replays of the wrecks were shown on television after the wreck. One of those at home was his mother, Shirley. She recalls cheering her son on as he was about to make his way inside the top 10. Then, the wreck happened, and she knew it was bad. I could not imagine this feeling as a mother. Watching your son in the wreck, then he's not out of the car. You're just watching on television like everyone else with no additional information. Everything around you is going on like normal. The broadcast shows some replays, cuts to commercials, ads play for a few minutes, people in the grandstands go to the concessions, ESPN promotes the next race, all while her son was in that truck fighting for his life. The incident shook Fairgrove, Roper's hometown in Missouri. It hit everybody in our town hard. It shook the town to its core, said David Bates, a high school classmate and one of Roper's closest friends. Evidently so, as his funeral, hosted at his old high school, drew over 600 family and friends. The funeral consisted of racing-themed floral arrangements with Roper's 26 truck everywhere. He was the little guy from the little town of just 1,500 that had made it. Everyone looked up to him. He was an inspiration to everyone around him. You could tell he was a talented race car driver. He put a lot of effort into it, and he had a great right foot. Back then, it took a lot from the driver to get one of those modifieds around the track because they didn't handle really well. The IndyCar drivers were also at this scene. The Truck Series race was running as a support race for the IndyCar race on Sunday. Roper would also be on the minds of the IndyCar stars heading into the race. Scott Goodyear stated, As a race car driver, we know it can happen to us. We're in this business, and we understand that. When you have an accident, you go, Hey, I escaped. You always know it might be the big one. As with every tragedy at this time, the call for the softwall technology was back. It was new technology and controversial at the time. Eddie Gossage had this to say when he was questioned about softwalls. I've never been a proponent or opponent of softwall technology because it doesn't exist. Softwall experiments exist. I think a lot of fans have the concept that if you just strap on a bunch of mattresses on the walls, you fixed it. And that's not the case. You can cause more problems than you resolve. To give Eddie the benefit of the doubt, it was not a proven science. But it sort of seems like he was defending himself in a way, right? And he wasn't going to change his mind on the new walls. Of course, he was getting a lot of heat, because this was a crash during pure racing, not a mechanical failure like with Petty and Irwin. There wasn't much to blame except the track itself. But this was just another, perhaps preventable death in this time, simply due to a lack of effort. In his memory, the Tony Roper Scholarship Fund was set up. Another comforting thing for the family was the message boards that were set up on his website, TonyRoper.com, which you can still view to this day. Hundreds of people grieved alongside the Roper family, which must have made the family feel less alone during the time. Unfortunately, things would only get worse for the Roper family. Dean Roper, Tony's father, tragically passed away during an ARCA event at the Illinois State Fairgrounds the very next year. It was revealed that he had suffered a heart attack, which resulted in a strange wreck. His car found the pit road entry, hit some pit equipment, and sent spectators running. Nobody else was injured. On top of this, Dean's father Jim died in the middle of 2000. Dean lost his father and son in the same year, then lost his life in the following. Three generations of Ropers gone within a year. What a horrible string of events for the family. Dean, in only 37 starts, was at the time the winningest driver on dirt in the history of the series with nine victories. 
Dean raced a couple of times per season in ARCA, but he was always competitive. Getting back to Tony, one of his friends, Mike Davis, a fellow 1983 Fairgrove High graduate, said Roper's focus was narrow and his hobbies outside of racing were few. What a great guy he was, and we had a lot of fun together. He was definitely a workaholic. Racing was Tony's life. He died doing what he loved. Rest in peace to Tony and Dean both. So that's it for this video. This was a sad video, definitely, even relative to the other tragedies I've looked at in the sport. I'm glad to finally dive into Tony's story and share it with all of you. It's not talked about as much as the other two from 2000. The truck series Nobody isn't on the surface as intriguing as Irwin or Petty's stories, but that doesn't make it any less tragic by any means. So if you guys want to see more of these type of videos, be sure to subscribe so you never miss a video, and leave a comment on what you want me to cover on the next one. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.